Thank you. Good evening and uh, thank you for all coming to our wonderful world of mechanical music. You've just heard my older brother John play the Strauss Waltz Morning Papers on a barrel organ which is about 180 years old. Before that I played the Cuckoo Waltz on a street organ that was made about 40 years ago. Since my teens I've always wanted to own a street organ. Uh, <coughs> 
like this. And I've only achieved this ambition this year when I bought my Elko Goblin. And this evening we're going to share with you some of our joint passion for these instruments and to play some great music on ones that we've collected over the past 60 years. Now, I'm the youngest of six, and we were brought up in a house in Leicestershire that was full of music, and mum and dad had collected jazz 78 records in the 1930s, which they often played. And since dad had installed speakers in all the rooms of the house, <laughs> when he played an Ellington record downstairs, each of us could enjoy it in the privacy of our own bedroom. Uh, my siblings played various instruments, but I didn't feel the odd one out because I could take turns to play our pianola, which my grandfather had bought new before the First World War. It looks and plays just like a normal piano, uh, but is fitted with a sophisticated mechanism that allows it to play music that was pro programmed onto rolls of punched paper. And I've got a roll here. I've got quite a lot of them, actually. Punch, punch paper. Um, <coughs> All you have to do is pedal and it plays music on its own. It was magic, absolute magic. Uh, in a fit, uh, no, we, we no longer have the pianola, but in a fit of enthusiasm in my teens, I bought about 700 rolls, uh, which sadly, these people don't use the pianola as much, and sadly, these days are virtually valueless, and I don't know what to do with them. There are some downstairs, please help yourself to all of them. <laughs> So mechanical music was something that I'd accepted all my life, but in my early teens, the interest grew. And it's easy for me to know where this came from. It came from my big brother, John. <laughs> the theme of our show tonight is recorded music. I'm a historian, and I'm interested in the history of the different attempts to preserve performances of music in generations before the invention of the phonograph or digital recording. Phonograph is analog recording and all the digital recording. There are two things relevant to this that I've had a lifetime appreciation of, without myself excelling in either of them, really, music and craftsmanship. When I was at school at Harrow, a grand double pipe organ was being installed in the twin towers of the speech room by the organ building firm Harrison and Harrison of Durham. I spent as much time as I could hanging out with the men installing it. Carrying organ pipes was my way of avoiding cricket. <laughs> In my holidays, I started to build a pedal-operated organ out of an old plywood packing case. Not much success there. During a long convalescence while I was at Oxford, recovering from jaundice, I spent many, many hours in bed making a mechanical singing bird out of, out of cardboard and paper. <laughs> this is it. You wind the handle at the front and it sings. The, voice, the noise comes out the grid at the side and the bird on top did open his beak. Um, yeah. It did sing as planned at the time, but passing years has not been kind to it, so I shall not attempt to play it to now. There we are. My, my school piano lessons were dreary and failed to make me into a musician. I would cheat by learning to play a piece by heart rather than reading the music book. They did at least kindled my interest in early music, which flourished in my recorder playing and the friendship with Maurice Byrne at Oxford. We used to search junk shops for obscure and obsolete musical instruments. In 1961, I found this instrument, the English automatic seraphone. <laughs> it's a reed organ with only 20 notes and plays from rolls or bands of punched paper. It was in good original condition, if it was a little short of wind, but only had with it hymns and popular songs from the 1890s. So I set to work on some drawer lining paper from Boots and a scalpel. And this was 1969, remember. Thank <laughs> you. 
bit of paper. <laughs> so it's about 12 foot of paper <laughs> and I cut holes in it. Um, I counted this morning there are 514 holes. And of course, each hole involved four cuts of the scalpel. So that was me doing a lot of devoted work in my study room at, uh, at Oxford, when I should have been doing my Latin prep and all. <coughs> <laughs> so I've... Um, what have we got now? Over the past 60 years, I've tried reducing all kinds of music down to the 20 notes available on this instrument. And um, early music, of course, and, and medieval music, and uh, all sorts of Victorian popular music. And well, you, you did some jazz and modern yeah. experimental compositions by my friend Henry, who's out there somewhere. Being 11 years younger than John, I was always fascinated by everything he did. And, and he'd spent long hours into the night cutting a band of music. And uh, it was always exciting in the morning. The floor was covered with this confetti. <laughs> and uh, next morning, hearing his newest arrangement, I especially remember your version of uh, Dusty Springfield's 1963 hit, I Only Want to Be With You. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. <clears throat> well, in our family, we are devotees of the carol singing tradition from the Sheffield area. And uh, tonight I'm wearing a red tie I inherited from my father-in-law from the Grenocide male voice choir that he used to sing with. And uh, we sing a lot of these uh, songs around Christmas time. And this is uh, a glee that was published in 1810, but has been adopted by the tradition and, and is known as the Saddleworth Anthem. Hail, smiling morn. Thank you. 
<laughs> in the 1960s, uh, there was a growing interest in restoring me old mechanical musical instruments, and we became members of the Music Box Society and the Fair Organ Preservation Society, which kept us in touch with like-minded enthusiasts. At that time, there was only one remaining fair organ maker in the UK, but in Holland and Belgium, there was still a living tradition of making and operating them. So in 1966, at the age of 15, I went with John to Holland to track down some of these organs in the streets of Amsterdam and The Hague <coughs> and to visit an organ maker in Belgium. And fired up with a completely unrealistic teenage enthusiasm, I decided to build a small fair organ. I must have been about 16 when I rang the doorbell of Chiappa Organs Limited in Clerkenwell, London and was greeted by the owner, Victor Chiappa. When I explained my intention, he invited me into his workshop, which for me was like an Aladdin's cave. It was stacked high with ancient pipes and carcasses of dismantled organs, all adorned with highly decorated, but probably pre-war and faded <coughs> painting. He was very patient with me, but before too long, my enthusiasm to actually build an organ waned, and now, 55 laters, uh, years later, I'm a proud owner of this ready-made one. So how do these organs work and how is the music produced and stored on them? One thing that they certainly isn't is a hurdy-gurdy. This is a medieval stringed instrument that has survived to the present day and its only similarity is that it's played by turning a handle. Well, hang on, I disagree with you there. The, the term hurdy-gurdy hasn't been traced back earlier than the 18th century. And it means any instrument played with a street musician just winding a handle, whether it was a real fiddle like you're talking about, or a barrel organ, or even a barrel piano. He's probably right, but I'm currently doing the talking, so don't listen to him. <laughs> An organ uh, <coughs> uses a set of pipes to produce the notes. You can see there a series of what's basically <coughs> whistles, uh, each which produces one note, each individual pipe. Uh, play, only plays one note. And a reed organ, like the seraphone you've just heard, uses the same kind, some kind of vibrating metal reed that are used in accordions, parmoniums, concertinas, and mouth organs. Each individual reed plays one note when air is passed through it. There are a number of different names for these type of organs, fair organs, street organs, dance organs, busker organs. But how do they store up the music? Up until the 1890s, the programming of music on any of these instruments was done by a series of pins and staples on the outside surface of a wooden barrel. There's a small barrel here that John pinned. You won't be able to see much of it there, but each individual pin will play one note and each staple in there will play a longer note. And on one barrel like this, they could sometimes get about eight different tunes side by side, so you only have to move it along. I've got a video here which may of a much bigger organ, which may <coughs> make it easier to understand. Yes, there it is. It's silent, but you can see there are, there are things called keys on the top. I'm sorry if the camera's moving around, but this is just the one I got. These keys moving up and down are being being moved by the keys on the barrel. They're widely spaced because there are so many tunes on, on the barrel. Things moved on in the, 19th, the end of the 19th century when makers started storing music on paper or cards. So this is punch card there. The punch card system had been invented by Joseph Jacquard in France at the start of the century and had gone on to completely revolutionise the weaving industry. Later, it had been used by Charles Babbage for the invention of the difference engine, which some people credit as being the forerunner of our modern computer. It's such a simple system. Each note plays one, each hole plays one note, ones and zeros. It's the binary system, which is the basis of all computers. Aha, binary. Ones and zeros, ons and offs. That's the basis of digital computing. And my little singing bird was to form its song from an analog record, a cam profiled to vary the pitch of its whistle. But all these musical instruments here play digital recordings. And this reminds me of the limitations of musical notations 
as written recording of music. What I call the black dots concentrate on defining when a note is to start, but not so much on when it ends or how it is to be played. And all the time I was playing early music on the recorder, especially when performing on stage, I was entirely dependent on the black dots. If, somebody, if I had knocked my music over, I had to stop. But only when I discovered folk music was I liberated from them and came to recognise the strength of playing by heart, especially for dancing. Now, for music played from the heart, what an inspiring example is the song of a songbird. Artless, of course, but also learned by imitation. <laughs> Here's an imitation of a bird. <coughs> Well, there you are. That was the kind of automaton I tried to make when I was in bed convalescing. And of course, it doesn't learn to sing by imitation. It just sings the same song every time. In the later 17th century, there was a craze across Europe for caged birds trained to sing musical tunes. Now think of it, that's music recorded for a live performance. Now the training method was to play the same tune repeatedly to a bird, such as a specially bred canary, on a, a, little, a little recorder called a flageolet, a little recorder. It became quite a cottage industry in the Vosges mountains and the Black Forest and appealed to wealthy amateurs as well. It was rather like the earlier tulip mania in, uh, when people were paying fantastic prices for uh, exotically bred uh, tulips, fancy canaries with virtuoso repertoires fetched fantastic prices. And it interests me, the name as well as the sound of the flute that in English we call recorder was intimately associated with birdsong. Recording was also the technical term for the learning stage in the bird's acquisition of a tune. He would start by giving a chirp, and then giving a call, and then doing his recording, and finally he was able to sing his song round. I've got a book here by a Frenchman, Jean-Claude Hervieux de Chanteloup, first published in 1709. It's a guide to breeding and caring for fancy varieties of canaries and training them to sing little tunes. It gives suggested tunes in the book. It was translated and published all across Europe, in Italy, Holland, Germany, and England. And in London, a book of tunes was published, The Bird Fancier's Delight, <laughs> for teaching all sorts of singing birds within the compass and faculty of each bird. Now, my copy of the French guide is the third edition, dated 1745, and it mentions the newly perfected mechanization of the training of canaries, serins, by playing tunes on a miniature barrel organ, or serinette. This instrument must have helped bird trainers, whether professional or amateur, but was also sold in large numbers as a musical toy. This is a serenette made in Mircourt in the Vosges Mountains. Thank you. Um, and these things were often made for export to, to the British uh, market, because this one plays God Save the Queen, so it must be a Victorian one. 
and uh, I'll play you a, a, a tune on it, a tune for the bird, and then one which you should be able to hear. And I'm playing this tune because it's interesting because uh, it survives as a tune used among Morris dancers and folk dancers called Getting Up the Stairs, I think. Mm. Uh, it plays in a very chirpy octave, so you've got to listen carefully. I can play it an octave lower. The sound of that serenade played solo may not be very exciting, but imagine how marvellous that same piece of music would have appeared when it was performed by live canary. Uh, with hindsight, I think it's a rather questionable way to treat a bird in this manner. Each bird may have been trained in the dark for months, and uh, this is some kind of gaslighting as far as I'm concerned. Uh, these instruments were also made in various sizes. I've got one over here dated about 1800, which I think was called a perroquet, presumably appropriate for teaching a parakeet, although it also plays an accompaniment to the tune. Uh, I think it's a bit of a dirty trick to play chords to a bird. So I imagine this instrument was not actually intended for teaching purposes. My serenade was made by the firm of Cabas in Mircourt, and uh, I think it must have been the father of the maker of that one, because uh, it says Cabas et Fils. And uh, they also made larger organs, and I've got an earlier one made by Charles Cabas. And uh, I think these were made for sort of family entertainment and dancing. And this one was made about uh, 1820. We're going to move it around. So it's a nice piece of furniture, Empire style French. <coughs> Is that about right? Yeah. <coughs> Again, I've chosen this tune to plays because it says it's called the Persian dance, uh, but we know it among folk dancing. Uh, uh, English folk dance enthusiasts as the tune to which the dance called Gallopede is danced. Thank you. 
these organs. They were all wrecks and needed a lot of restoration and attention. Leaky old bellows needed recovering, a mechanism in need of engineering restoration. I'd made contact with a splendid independent organ builder in Kendall called Jim Hall, who had served his time at Harrison and Harrison's. Over the years, Jim meticulously brought our instruments back to life, and we used to enjoy our trips to his workshop in Kendall. And Jim, Jim had an intense fear of woodworm and would dunk all the wooden parts, parts in a vat of noxious woodworm killer that had a strong, lingering paraffin stench. And we did try to convince him to use a low-odor low brand, but he showed no interest, and we kept on pushing him. Uh, and he eventually said, he explained that most of his work came from uh, restoring church organs. And parishioner, parishioners might have spent years in fundraising to pay for the work. And he said, once I've completed the work, most of them won't be able to hear the difference, so I want them to smell the difference. <laughs> and, <coughs> Jim, lovely man, is long dead now, but the stench of his organ restoration still lingers on. So come up in the interval and have a sniff for yourself, see which ones he's worked on. Small barrel organs were used in the 19th century by street musicians. But the disadvantage of a barrel organ is the limited repertoire of music that could be stored on one barrel, usually up to about 10 tunes. Many Italian organ makers had emigrated to Paris and over the 19th century they began to develop a larger and louder barrel organ for fairgrounds. And a breakthrough came in the 1890s when they adopted the existing technology from the weaving industry by using punched cards to store the music. This allowed organs to play longer and keep updating their repertoire of music. And my goblin here uses this punch card and I can now order music from extensive catalogues of modern tunes and other tunes. I know this isn't a modern one, but I bought it a few weeks ago. It's the Peanut Vendor, and I love it. I love it. If you want to know the moral of this song, 50 million little monkeys can't be wrong. It's... <laughs>
Thank you. I would have clapped also if I'd heard someone playing that on one of these organs, but it's interesting to stop and think for a moment about who one's applauding. Was it for the maker of this? Or did one applaud for me, who bought the music and turned the handle? Or was it for the organ? Or was it for Kevin Byrne, who did that wonderful arrangements for this organ, which only actually has 20 notes? It's probably a bit of all above, but it's interesting to think about. In the UK, at the end of the 19th century, fairgrounds were enormously popular, as this was the only place people could view a modern marvel of moving pictures. The frontage of these travelling fairground bioscope shows were extravagant affairs with an organ adorned with lavish carving, electrical lights and dancing girls performing before each showing. There was great competition between fairground owners who could have the largest, most elaborate and loudest organ to attract the punters to pay to see their show. There were dozens of these massive travelling bioscope shows touring the country. But this era ended with the Great War and with the advent of cinemas in the 1920s and many of the massive organs were cut down in size to play elsewhere on fairgrounds. Here is a picture of one of them, just one, one of the many. You can see by the house there, this is a massive, a massive structure. There's a man standing here holding a tuppenny bit. There's crowds there. There would have been dancing girls all along there. There's an entrance, another entrance there. But between that pillar and there, that was all organ, all organ. That organ has survived. There it is. It's seven and a half tons. And that's, you can see how massive that, that uh, is. It's, it's wonderful that it survived. Most of the surviving organs fell into disrepair during the Second World War, but a few did survive, and you've just seen one of them. One of the biggest bioscope organs was known as the Mammoth Gavioli and was made in 1909 by Gavioli of Paris. And it somehow survived both wars, and in 1954, a guy called George Palmley and a group of enthusiasts began restoring it, and it became an insp inspiration to other enthusiasts to seek out and restore more organs. The mammoth gavioli lives up to its name. Like the Pat Collins one, it's over seven and a half tons, mounted on its own trailer, as the organ is over 25 feet wide. It's probably wider than this stage itself. Uh, it has over 1,100 pipes. And here's a brief video of it to give you an idea of its magnificence. Thank you. Um, 
You visited in the early 60s, didn't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> and I visited George a few years later. I would been in my teens then. Uh, I took a train to Chesterler Street, and he took me... I knocked on his door, I was told where it was, and he took me up to a builder's yard or a scrapyard, I don't know, where it was stored for winter. Uh, and he had to grovel around starting up a big diesel generator. And then we climbed into the narrow passageway along the back of the organ. I mean, teeny little uh, <coughs> passageway there. And it was sheeted up in the front, so you couldn't... All the sound was coming back to it to us and he started it playing and the whole front was sheeted up so we were nearly inside the organ and we heard it full blast and it was it was wildly out of tune but it was just for me it was wonderful a private concert just for me and I was always jealous of John's seraphone and he eventually found one in another shop and uh, for me but I always hankered off for something bigger and in 1977 I bought this organ, a Meloton organ it's called. It's a reed organ and it's a barrel organ. I bought it in St. Stephen Street for £100. And Meloton organs were loud and durable instruments intended for street musicians. And I don't think many of them survived because of the hard conditions of working on the street. This one was probably a guess made in the, 19, in the 1870s in Manchester. And I often wondered about what kind of life it had had because it was a battered carcass when I brought it. You know, a lot of the casework wasn't there. Over the last past 45 years, it's been worked on and improved by five different craftsmen, including Jim Hall. You can, well, you can have a sniff and you, <laughs> if you don't believe me. Um, it was only last year that it was finally brought into such good playable condition. It plays a selection of eight tunes, and interestingly, two of them date from the early 1950s. So it must have had a complete replacement barrel made then. So, who remembers Vera Lynn? <laughs> I won't attempt to sing in the style of the good dame, but I'll sing in the style of an itinerant 1950s organ grinder, which I'm afraid means very loud. <coughs> you may recognize the tune. first part, but I think you should hear this closing tune. Many of these organs, like the two from Mirecourt in France, were made for sale in England. The serenet plays God Saves the Queen, that must be Victoria, but this earlier cabas organ plays God Save the King, so it gives me the opportunity of taking my hat off. Thank you. 
We're having a short break now, and after that, we'll be telling you more about music boxes as well. Uh, Ian's going to be downstairs in one of the studio in the studio downstairs and playing a music box, and we'll be down there uh, once we've set up for the next uh, half. So uh, it's going to be some fun and games down in the studio. Um, and John's chosen some good interval music for you who want to stay up here. That's going to be on an instrument there, the polyphon, which we haven't talked about. And here's a tune that might get you in the mood for buying something cold in the interval. And you can come up on stage and have a look and sniff to see which ones will work on by Jim Hall. But please don't bring your ice creams with you. So see you after in the studio or after the, um, after the interval. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Oh, great. Thank you. 
Thank you. That was a crazy piece of music called Memory of, Memories of Circus Wrens, written in 1894 for the xylophone, actually. There are lots of versions on YouTube. It's wonderful. Uh, you can't help but smile playing such a daft tune. It's absolutely wonderful. This instrument was made in the 1820s, I think, and its repertoire includes contredance which is a French way of pronouncing country dances. And, but there's one tune that I'm particularly interested in because it, it seems to me to be Scottish, and I don't know if anybody here can identify it for me. mechanical musical instrument in the house when we brought up the White House in Ashby Barber, this heavy Swiss music box which lived on an oak chest on the landing. I think, I think, I think our dad bought it cheap because it was broken and he got it repaired by a local clockmaker, watchmaker. And uh, we certainly used it a lot. One of my younger brothers defaced the, um, the label, but we, <laughs> but we can uh, trace the tunes. There were six of us. I, I deny that accusation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've researched the music on it. It all dates from the 1840s, so it's quite an early uh, one by the famous maker Nicole Frere of Geneva and uh, I've chosen to listen to a tune particularly interests me. It's the Redowa Polka. The Redowa Waltz was a, a craze that went across Europe of a new way of dancing the waltz so you spin with a kind of polka step in it, I don't quite understand. And there was also a polka to go with it. And I realised that I heard this tune when I was young. Uh, but then I recognised it again uh, when I was at school. I bought a record of uh, Swedish music. Well, I thought it was Swedish music by Hugo Alfen called the Swedish Rhapsody. And he uses the same tune. So these, these tunes go round and round. I've uh, never... Sorry, on you go. Well, uh, so this has a big barrel and it plays two tunes. So we've got to hear two tunes. To, to hear one tune, we have 
I think it would be a song first and then the Red Oa Polka. I've never known the names of the individual tunes themselves, but they seem to be embedded into my DNA as I've heard them all my life and presumably my siblings also. I still have the memory of Dad lying in bed after Dad had said goodnight to me and hearing the sound of the ratchet as he wound it up and left it playing with my bedroom door open. And those powerful springs which had been providing power for 100 years and now 150 would eventually slow down as the music got slower and slower and I would try to anticipate what would <laughs> be the last note before it finally stopped. Yeah, that brings back memories, particularly actually not being so close to it, this memories of being in bed. That wonderful resonant ringing tone is produced by tiny pins placed on a rotating barrel, which plucks a tuned steel comb that's held next to the barrel. I'm a practical person, and for me, part of the attraction of mechanical organs is they're constructed of materials I know well and use daily. It's not rocket science. These instruments have the ability to play complex and sophisticated music, and yet they're made of readily available materials, wood, leather, metal, and cardboard. But the Swiss music boxes that were popular then were amazing examples of sophisticated precision engineering in brass and steel, which are way, way beyond my skills. So most music boxes, like barrel organs, store their music on a barrel. But of course, there are other ways of storing the music. For example, here's a modern one that uh, works off a strip of punch card. I think I bought this in Holland. I was very excited to see a, a, a miniature like this. And I gave it to Julian a few years ago and arranged and punched on it one, one of his tunes. Is that the way it works? Yeah. Where should I go? Is it worth going near the microphone, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> 
Have a go. The standard music box like that plays with a barrel and thus it has a limited musical repertoire. At the end of the 1800s, the claim came a clever new development, the polyphon, made in Leipzig, Germany, which stores the music on an easily replaceable metal disc with raised projections on the underside of the disc to pluck the combs. This one here it was actually made in the 1960s and it, play, it was playing in the interval Dave Brubeck, to take five. But uh, most of the ones we've got are a, a, lot, a lot older than that. Ah. Ah. It hasn't got to the end yet. Spin that disc for us, brother. That uh, polyphon looks as though it's had a hard life working in a cafe or a pub. Uh, <coughs> but uh, John bought it because it still sounds well. and He's got dozens of discs to go with it, mostly seldom played, it must be said. And when he was searching for this one, he came across more that he'd forgotten he had. Is he going to play? A genuine penny. It will work on 50 pence pieces, but... Uh... <laughs> I chose that tune. It's a Russian tune, Kamarinskaya, the Russian Butterweek Dance. Uh, it's a folk tune adopted, well, particularly popularised by the, the composer Glinka as the energetic Cossack dance. You know that 
Cossack dances where the, the men are squatting down and their legs shoot out all right, and then the women do <laughs> athletic things. And it's a kind of repeated riff dance. It's great. As a historian, I've come to realize that in each generation, art music has drafted in tunes from folk and popular traditions, especially, excuse the pun, pun tapping into contemporary dance rhythms. In 1972, I gave a lecture on this subject at the Early Music Centre in London. I hired a van and loaded it with my barrel organs to illustrate the, the lecture. In the early music movement, there's also been a quest for authenticity, like performing on copies of old instruments, and also authenticity in style of interpretation and ornamentation. And that's something that's so well documented, especially in the mid-18th century, the age of reason, the age in France of the of Diderot's Universal Encyclopedia. And one figure in, in that era was an Augustinian monk with a lot of names. We call him Père Angremel. He must have had a lot of time uh, to research and publish a book on the subject. In 1775, he published this theoretical and practical guide to pinning music onto barrels. He called this latest technology tonotechnie, and he was excited by the possibility of recording performances from all sorts of instruments. But he, as for a start, he used the serenet as a starting point, a simple miniature barrel organ. And he was very thorough and precise in his theory. For instance, Dealing with the black dots, he defined every note as consisting of two parts, the sound and the silence that follows it. The trouble with black dot notation, it, it defines the start of a sound, but it doesn't concentrate much on, on, the, the, on its finish. And he also analysed in detail ornaments and the ratios of inequality for style and swing. And I followed his instructions by pinning new barrels for my serenade, Julian waved one in the first half. And it's, it's marvellous because um, his instructions are so precise that I found that sort of 97% of what I, do, I did was exactly specified. And, and it is really interesting. I'd done, uh, he gave two contrasting interpretations of the same tune. My, the point of my talk in London was that I was also inspired by the theory that we could use these original instruments as evidence of past performances. And we know that Handel and C.P. Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, all sorts of people composed for mechanical organs, often clockwork, self-acting ones like uh, a clock instead of chiming on bells with their little tune. And I particularly admire the flute clock pieces by Joseph Haydn, and have arranged several of them for my cell phone. Here is a minuet of his. I see I did this in 1961. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. 
Some people have suggested I need an electric motor for this. <laughs> but I enjoy playing the music, not just winding the handle. And I'm encouraged by the advice about the serenette that that Frenchman de Chanteloup gave in his Canary Training Manual. He said, although everyone can play a serenette, nevertheless, those who have knowledge of music are in a better position to make a proper and precise performance of it. I cut these bands in the 1960s, but have always dreamed of hearing them on a pipe organ as intended. We used to rely on Jim Hall, the church organ builder. Since then, we have emerged new generations of professionals specializing in mechanical organs. A couple of years ago, I was able to commission a young organ builder, Rob Barker, to make this organ to play from my 20-note bands. Let's listen to another Haydn flute clock piece. It's a minuet from one of his uh, string quartets that he arranged for flute clock. No, it isn't. I was going to play it to one. Right, I've done the wrong one, haven't I? Oh, well, let's have this one anyhow. This is a, yes, this is the minuet. This isn't what I intended. I got in the wrong order. <laughs> A, a flute clock piece for the, the goblin as well. Nice short one. I mean, a lot of the ones that were composed had to be a specific length because they only had the, um, the rotation of a barrel. <coughs> so this is number 32 by uh, Haydn.
Well, I visited Vicky, uh, Victor Chiappa. You did in the 1960s. Yeah, yeah yes. When I, when I visited Victor Chiappa in the 1960s, he showed me the process for creating the punch card, which uh, <coughs> hadn't changed, the process of making it hadn't changed from since the 1890s when it was started being used. It involved first making a written musical arrangement and then mapping it out and cutting it on thin card, a bit like this, uh, <coughs> and then using that to stencil onto thicker card, well, the final card, which was then punched out note by note on a treadle punch out. I mean, he showed me all this equipment. It was cumbersome and laborious process, and things began to change in the 1990s with the development of MIDI technology, and today musical arrangements can be made on a computer and the card can then be di directly cut using a laser cutter. That, that previous one was done with a laser cutter. And now some modern organs have bypassed the use of card altogether and operate with music stored on electric chips, electronic chips. <laughs> you can get about 100 tunes on a chip this size. And this is very practical and economic, but it holds no appeal to me whatsoever. <laughs> I like having control of what I play and how I play it. You can get loads of feeling into the music by the way you turn the handle. When I bought the Goblin, the first thing I did, even before I played it myself, was to take out the electric motor and convert it to play manually with a wheel. Basically, I love the process of grinding organs by hand, and I'm proud to be the most northerly members of BOGA, the British Organ Grinders Association. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> um, most large fair and street organs are made with actual percussion instruments that provide the rhythm for the melody. You saw that one and, and the <coughs> mammoth gavioli. But using a computer to prepare the musical arrangements of the tunes and still using the card has led to an entirely new rhythmic approach which creates the rhythm by playing massive block chords and I'm very enthusiastic about this new approach. And I want to share with you a brief extract of the work of Japanese genius, Koji Koji Moheji, uh, so you can actually hear and see his rhythmic experimentations. This guy is so prolific, every week he puts out, he seems to make another uh, card <coughs> and another arrangement. Uh, so I'm going to play a brief excerpt, it has to be brief, of a Japanese TV show signature tune arranged by him with the camera placed above the keyframe so you can actually see the shape of the music about a fraction of a second before it's played. And these massive block rhythmic chords appear on the card. <coughs> it couldn't be done on this, but it appears as, as lines actually punched across the card and uh, you'll see that that makes the sound of, <coughs> gives the impression of rhythmic rhythm. So.
<laughs> oh, I love I love that. I've listened to that thousands of times. I have actually got another organ from Rob Barker on on order. Uh, he's make, just started making it, and uh, I would love it if he could play that music. But uh, uh, there are a thousand more videos on YouTube. I'm afraid I spend far too much time in the evenings just looking. Uh, and in the program, it's, it gives you a couple of hints of where to look. So, John. Well, we've taken you through an account of our journey of discovery about the history of recorded music. And this has suggested some connections. To record means to recall to heart. And any live performance involves the performer's memory, whether in the heart or the mind or muscle memory, and playing by rote. The flute we, recall, we call a recorder may well take its name from its role in teaching birds to sing tunes. And this, there's a long history to this. For instance, Elizabeth I sent an elaborate barrel organ as a gift to the Sultan of Turkey. I don't know what he made of it, but uh, <laughs> it had singing birds on it as well. Henry VIII had an instrument that played music that goeth with a wheel, which reminds me of the phrase playing by rote. The technology involved in automata and mechanical music recorded on a revolving barrel is ancient. And certainly it's uh, mentioned in detail in Persia in, the, in 9th century Baghdad. And at that time, the Roman emperor in Byzantium was famous for having a gilded bronze tree whose branches were filled with birds of different sizes which imitated the songs of the different birds corresponding to their species. But to recreate a musical performance can no more succeed than a painting or photograph can reproduce its subject. But the striving for it has often produced something else, something interesting. The serenette became an amusing musical toy. The Swiss musical box generated a completely new kind of musical sound. And the big barrel organs, orchestrians, in trying to emulate a whole orchestra, produced a new sound characteristic of the fairground. We won't be playing an encore, so we're going to finish as we started with something new and something old, a couple of pieces each. Uh, this is the Celestina. The, no, it's the improved Celestina. It hasn't got the handle on it yet. No, well, that, that can all be sorted. Right, thank you. Um, oh, yes, and that's the volume control there. You, you can, you can shut, shut it down a bit. Um, yeah, I, I think it was the forerunner, the, an American forerunner of the, um, the Seraphone. And I mentioned I was a Dusty Springfield fan. I've got uh, a signed photo saying to Julian, love Dusty, in my, in my workshop. You can come and see me, I'm not lying. Um, yeah, so I remember the, gosh, December 63. If you cut it in December 63, I don't know when it was in the charts, but it was only shortly before that. I was, gosh, I was 13 then. There we go. <laughs>
Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> In 2006, uh, an extremely sexy Colombian singer had a massive hit, and I played this to a lot of younger people, and they recognize it immediately. I had to learn it uh, when I bought the organ. It came with it. Uh, the, uh, the singer was called Shakira. I think she's still on the go. She's a very talented singer, and this is a glorious song, Hips Don't Lie. Have a look on YouTube, but seeing her singing it, it's, uh, whew. I've chosen are old, as you might expect, my historical interest. You can't beat the little masterpieces that Haydn arranged for flute clocks. And let's see if this one works. <clears throat> When I was uh, giving my talk in 1972, 
watching the way I played the Viennese waltz on the Imhoff organ, a friend of mine in the audience spoke up and said, you've just exploded your theory that we can use these as impartial evidence of past performances. It's true. And I'm reminded of that hint from de Chanteloup in his uh, Canary Training book. I really enjoy playing this recorded music to an audience, creating what is in effect a fresh live performance. And I've had the greatest pleasure from playing for a room full of dancers. And for a ballroom dance, you can't beat a good old Viennese waltz. So now, as I turn the handle to perform the swing of this one, I shall see you as dancers in a large 19th century candlelit ballroom in your glistening clothes. Thank you all for being such an enthusiastic audience. It's been wonderful, absolutely packed. And special thanks to all the wonderful staff at the Eastgate for supporting us all this time to put on this show. All the proceeds are going towards this very, very precious community theatre. And we'd love to have played more of the music and told you more of our stories, but the miracle of these instruments is they'll keep on playing long after we're gone. They store music from the past and can always reactivate it and bring it back to life in the present. So let's celebrate those gifted and ingenious makers and craftsmen of the past who've designed and made them. Thank you.